Hi, welcome to Auntie Sue's Pandemic Kitchen. And today we're talking about ginger mint tea and perfection. And this day is not always perfect, for one thing, we're not in the kitchen. So bear with me and my imperfect world. And we'll talk about what it means, uh, what it means to be perfect. So when we talk about, when I have the healing compass, which I recommend that you can uh, get um, the book, Sustainable Health, Simple Habits to Transform Your Life. I have the Healing Compass in there. It's on the back cover in color. And it is something I've been working with for many years uh, and understanding how healing happens. So today, um, we are living in a very high-tech world. And we have a lot of metal energy. We have um, cars and computers, we have airplanes, we have um, air conditioning, refrigeration, heat, everything runs on metal and plastics and fossil fuels, which, um, which are somewhere between wood energy and metal um, because they have been in the ground for so long. So this is um, an overabundance of metal energy, an out of balance metal energy, because we are mowing down our forests uh, to make um, electricity so that we can run all of our convenient appliances and so that we can run our economy. And this has led to a very deep imbalance uh, and metal is the, the element that not only deals with metal, but it also is structure. So if you think of crystals and, and things, there's a lot of structure. And structure and practice can be wonderful things um, to enhance our lives. But when they predominate and they overwhelm the way they have, we can begin to see problems with our skin, our nose, our lungs, our colon, these are all <clears throat> um, the parts of our body that resonate with this metal energy. And we're now in the middle of a pandemic um, where uh, we have a virus that deeply affects our breathing. So it's coming in through the nose and it's certainly affecting the lungs. It sometimes does affect digestion as well. And we are also, Part of what we look at with the air pollution is not just the breathing, but the air pollution has also disturbed the atmosphere such that we have uh, more ultraviolet rays and we have more skin cancer. And this is all part of this overabundance, this imbalance in, in metal energy. And on top of that, we also are dealing with um, around the world, just as we are dealing with the, um, with the virus, we're also dealing with a world where we have, um, everyone is protesting Black Lives Matter. And again, we're talking about the skin here. So all of this resonates, all of this resonates with, <clears throat> with, um, with, the, with this metal energy. And, and it's our conscious universe like screaming at us to say, to pay attention and to wake up. So this is a, um, an important moment in time for us. Um, and um, so we can treat the symptoms of the air pollution and the skin cancer and those kinds of things. We can develop vaccines, we can develop drugs, and we can develop sunblocks that we can slather on to protect us from the sun's rays. Of course, we're also destroying coral reefs with those, but, um, but all of these remedies come at the end point. And what we need to do is trace it back to the beginning point, the root point, which is that we have this, we're far more interested in the metal world that we've created, the machine world that we've created, the tech world that we've created, than we are in the natural world that is what really gives us life. And particularly wood energy gives us the air that we breathe because it's plants and the plants create oxygen. So on the healing compass, <clears throat> in the east and west positions of the compass or the right and left positions of the compass, we have um, metal energy on the right and uh, wood energy on the left. So metal energy is actually in the west and wood energy is in the east, if you look at it in that way. So that's the two components 
pieces of the compass and these two elements are often in some sort of balance and in the middle we have earth energy um, which is the, the center point of the compass. So we need to get back in balance. We need to do something about the fact that we have um, that we have so much metal energy overwhelming our um, our wood energy, overwhelming our planet, um, <clears throat> and and all of this is is to give us conveniences and appliances and stuff that allow us and people as well allow us to live like royalty. We all want to live like royalty. We want to have people who wait on us. We want to have machines that wait on us. And somehow, as, you know, wood energy is the occupation of play. Wood energy is the occupation of play. And so it is a four-letter word. But work has also become a four-letter word. Instead of being something that you practiced and got good at and shared with other people, it's become something that you do not in service of yourself and the people that you love and your family and your community, but in the service of um, uh, impersonal corporate entities that are driving both the destruction of the world and our, um, and our economy. So we are kind of in a very difficult position and people are, um, People are coming to terms with this. We're listening. We've had to listen to the virus. Uh, and people are having to listen to the voices of people who are complaining about um, the way that other people have been treated and that we need to become, we all need to become essential workers, essential workers for ourselves and our family and, um, and not ask that off into the non-essential people. The non-essential people are the ones who are staying at home. If you're staying at home and we're working virtually from home, you're not probably very essential. The essential tasks are food, clothing, and shelter. And those are the kinds of things that, that people did, um, worked on. Um, and I read anthropologists who say that actually the amount of time that when they study cultures where people are still living like hunter-gatherers, that they find that on average, those people spend 20 hours out of every week on food, clothing, and shelter. And if you think about it, we all spend 20 hours probably on food, clothing, and shelters, and then we spend another 40 to 60 to 80 hours working at something for somebody else that bears no direct relationship to our food, clothing, and shelters. So no wonder we're all feeling overworked and unhappy. So one of the other things that resonates with um, metal energy is purity. Of course, you know, crystals are pure energy, are pure, are pure substances. Diamonds, in fact, are, are almost pure carbon. Um, and that, and that forms that crystalline structure that, um, that is so coveted and so treasured. Uh, indigenous people probably treasured those things because they were rare, but now we have this, we have this ability to keep trying, making everything perfect, making everything perfect. And the color that's associated with metal energy is either gold, which is the purity, again, of, of that metal, or white is the other color. And so we often associate purity and whiteness, and this has gotten us into a lot of trouble as well. But we need to remember that in places where five element theory has been practiced and uh, for you know, 5,000 years, the color white is associated with death. So this is again, the metal energy comes at, at the fall of the year when things are drying up and dying. And we need to recognize that purity in the way that we've been pursuing it and the high tech way we've been pursuing it is, is problematic. And we need to listen to this conscious universe that's screaming at us to wake up and, and smell the roses, literally smell the roses. Use your nose to take in those wonderful essences, plant essences. We know that wood, um, that aromatherapy, uh, people who do aromatherapy use the volatile oils of plants to heal people. And we have 
if you go to the blog post, which I would really recommend you go to the blog post, leave a comment, um, like the blog, like the YouTube video, I would really appreciate it if you do that. Uh, but when, when we, um, <clears throat> <clears throat> when there's a link there to uh, research on lavender, uh, the scent of lavender actually healing anxiety. So smelling flowers like roses, smelling flowers like lavender, that smelling the flowers can help us with our own anxiety. And, <clears throat> um, you know, smelling flowers is going to be good for you. But if you're huffing gas fumes and glue and uh, some of these high-tech substances, you're not going to feel good. And in fact, they will kill you. And sometimes they will uh, take away your ability to think and remember um, and move with coordination. And one of the things that's so cool about the sense of smell is that it goes into our brains in one very short synapse. It makes into directly into the part of our brain that enables us to do memory that enables emotions, connects us with emotions. So memory, emotions, and, um, and our digestion are all intimately linked with smell. And uh, metal energy, this, the flavors of metal energy are those bright flavors, the savory flavors, the spicy flavors, the real memorable. So our comfort foods are the savory foods. And um, spicy foods are also um, anything with a lot of flavor, especially when we smell it. So if you put cinnamon in your mouth and hold your nose, it feels like flour in your mouth. And it's only when you let go of your nose that you can tell the difference because this the smell that actually gives the flavor. So this is important to remember. So when the conscious universe is screaming at us, um, it is always working for the greater good. And the greater good is not necessarily our whims and fancies, nor the whims of our leaders and governments and economies. It's the, it's the greater good to the environment. And we're not that center of the environment. So we need to listen to this change and take in this moment of transformation. This is something we've been talking about a lot on the pandemic kitchen, but taking in this moment of transportation transformation. If we, we are going to keep getting these kinds of screaming messages from the conscious universe until we listen to it. So what can we do to listen? What can we do to make this um, happen? And um, so I've got, a, I've got about four suggestions here that you can do. What do we do there's only so much we can't control outside of ourselves, but we can control what's in our sphere. So number one, embrace imperfection. Embrace your mistakes and find inspiration in them. Let go of seeking perfection. And I'm sorry I wrote that in my blog because the whole day has been one mistake after another since then. But I am taking inspiration from them. <laughs> so. Um, Number two, smell the roses, smell the grass when you cut it, smell the rain, smell the people that you love and the animals that you love, smell what's around you, take in the smell, don't shut it out. So interesting to me that this virus, one of the first signs is that you lose your sense of smell, smell and taste. So they're very connected. So this is important. So smell things, you know, smell stuff. Um, Listen also, number three, listen to your intuitive mind, okay? And the intuitive mind, we access it through meditation. We access it through prayer. We access it through dreams. So we'll never access the, you will never access your intuitive mind, which is the wood mind, is the intuitive mind. The logical, rational mind is that metal mind. So the, the intuitive mind, um, we access that through, um, meditation, prayer, and <clears throat> in dreams, we'll never access it through the news and we'll never access it through social media. So this is one of the things that I recommend in the Sustainable Health book is turning off the media so that you can sleep, so that you can dream because that's when we're going to get that connect to the conscious universe through our in intuitive mind. And fourthly, ginger mint tea. So 
Dr. Liu, who's the guy I study with, he recommended ginger mint tea. He recommends it a lot, but he really, um, in the, the programs that he has been doing with people uh, over the past couple of months, um, really re reinforcing that if you want to help your breathing, you're gonna drink ginger mint tea. And, and one of the reasons is, so ginger, which is here, I was showing it to some people earlier. This is a big, lovely piece of ginger. It still has growing little parts of it that can grow on it. And I'm gonna actually plant some of it later uh, tomorrow. Uh, and anyhow, so ginger comes from the earth. It, it grows in the earth, it grows underground. So this is earth energy. Oh look, <laughs> Noel's got some ginger too. Um, <clears throat> but it comes from the earth and the earth is balancing and grounding and, and it's good for the stomach and the digestion. Mint, and I don't have any live mint to show you, um, but I do have some, a box of mint here that you can see. This is dried mint from my garden in New York. And mint is wood energy, very much wood energy because mint is very, if, if you wanna grow some mint, you plant it in a pot and you'll get plenty of it. If you go to a garden center, you buy a little bit of mint, you put it in a pot, you're gonna get plenty. You'll be able to you know, grow enough mint for your tea needs. Uh, if you put it in your garden, you will get to see how wood energy can take over everything. So, um, and this is why mint is so healing. Any plant that you have difficulty killing is gonna be good for your health. So this is uh, one of the things, and mint is just abundant, and it, um, and it is called in Spanish, yerba buena, the beautiful herb, the good herb. So it is uh, important in many cultures. I had a friend who was Greek, and she said, uh, or her parents were from Greece, uh, and she, uh, she said, you always had to have a mint plant in the yard uh, in her culture. They always had to have mint because that was um, so healing. So what happens is, is the, the ginger, the grounding of the ginger and the fact that it also grows um, and the mint will balance out that overabundant mental energy. We need to like ground that metal energy. We need to, to bathe that metal energy and bring balance because we overbalance with the metal energy now and we need to bring balance in. I have metal on both hands, but this is the wood hand. This is the left hand, <clears throat> which is also considered female, and the right hand is considered male in traditional Chinese medicine. Connects to male energy. So, um, and in Ayurvedic as well. Um, so, and lastly, what we really need to do is just inhale, exhale, and repeat. Very important to do that. So we want to leave behind a world to our children. We need to leave behind a world that is full of, of uh, plants and air and walk, clean water and clean earth. These are what will sustain life. And we need to, uh, a metal world is not going to be a world that sustains life, but a wood, but a wood world um, and a balance it will sustain life. We want to celebrate that diversity that uh, is present in, in both the metal world and in the wood world. Uh, there's plenty of diversity and we have certainly lots of diversity in our human world as well and we definitely need to celebrate that if we want to leave behind anything of value for our children. Uh, we choose our healing paths. Um, we choose our healing path by the actions that we do. We choose the actions that we do by the thoughts that we think, and we choose the thoughts that we think by the beliefs that we hold. So when we can change our beliefs uh, to encompass um, healing and health and understanding that, that we live in a world of abundance and we live in a world not that's out to get us, you know, we've been sort of, talking about being at war with a virus. That's like saying you're at war with the natural world. You, you can't really be 
um, at war with that. We have to find balance and balance and harmony is really what we're looking at, you know, and right now we've got a very loud horn section with the virus, but we need to bring in some violins and some woodwinds and some other instruments to, um, to bring that harmony. And on the blog also, here's the other reason why you want to go to the blog because the recipe's on the blog. <clears throat> at the end of the article, um, the recipe will be there. Uh, and I'll have a link to it on the YouTube video as well. So we have, um, uh, so how are you gonna make your tea? So you're gonna have this ginger here. This is what it looks like when it's big and fresh. And this is what it looks like when it's sort of dehydrated and been sitting around for a while. You can use either. Or you can even use tea bags, ginger of gin, dry ginger tea. But what you want to do with this, especially if it's dried like this, you can use you can use this as well. But the dry, the more dried up, you want to slice it. And I was going to actually show you some of this stuff, except that the perfection part of this day got away from me. Um, but you're going to slice your ginger up into you know little slices, you know. They're really, you can't make any mistakes with this. Just slice it up some kind of way. Put it in, um, and some people peel the skin off. I tend to leave the skin on because I'm going to be putting it into boiling water. I might cut off. You can see there's a little bit of mold there. I like to get rid of my molds. They're not always good for us. Um, but take off any of the bad parts. Slice it up. Put it in water. Bring it to a boil. Let it simmer for five, five minutes or more and that will bring out the ginger flavor. You need to boil ginger to really get that good flavor. Now, sometimes when I'm in a hurry, if I have this kind of ginger, I'll grate about a tablespoon full per cup of tea. And you can make this in big quantities and then refrigerate it and, uh, and use it as a nice, it's a nice iced tea. Because even though the stomach doesn't like cold and the body doesn't like cold, ginger has a hot essence. So even if you drink ice, you know, ginger ale or ice ginger tea, you're still gonna, your body's still gonna get that warming essence from the ginger. So sometimes I'll grate, grate this up, um, but you can boil it up. And if you're gonna make iced tea, you're better off to do the boiling method. Then once you've boiled it and let it simmer for about five minutes, then you're gonna add your mint. I add about a spoonful per cup. But once again, experiment with this. You can't make any mistakes, or you could make mistakes, but you're gonna be inspired by them. Just like I was inspired by my little smoking project with my chicken, which is why my dinner was late. But it was also very inspirational, and I'm gonna make it again. So you've got your, your mint, you've got your mint here, you've got your ginger, you've added it all together. And then you're gonna put in a little bit of honey or some brown sugar to sweeten it. And again, use what you feel is right. And that both the brown sugar and the honey, honey's very good for the lungs always. And uh, the brown sugar is also something that Dr. Lou recommends um, with this particular tea. Sometimes honey, lately he's been talking about brown sugar. But whatever you put in it, um, it will taste delicious. And then you're going to take your ginger mint tea and you're going to sit outside and watch the wind blow through the trees and the, listen to the sound of the birds. Our planes are going to be coming back very shortly in the same quantities that we had them before, probably, maybe not. But um, I know in New York, I can hear the birds all the time here in Maine, although I can also hear planes flying overhead sometimes as well. But they're flying high, whereas in New York, I didn't hear very many birds because the planes were flying low and the traffic and that kind of stuff. So take advantage of these few weeks before everything ramps up to sit outside with your ginger tea or sit at a window with your ginger tea and watch the wind blow and listen to the sound of the birds and connect to that conscious universe, which is what will balance us and keep us all healthy. Don't be afraid to break and bend the rules uh, of everything I've said and everything I've ever said and everything you've ever heard and not this recipe notwithstanding. So play around with it. Uh, and that's 
Um, that's what I have to say about ginger mint tea and perfection for tonight. And I'm going to um, open it up to questions now if anybody's got any. So we got anybody who wants to make a question or a comment? Roberta's got her hand up. Okay, Roberta. Yeah, you said that anything that is uh, that grows wild is, is probably good for you? No, I didn't say that. Because <laughs> um, poison, ivy, oh, poison yeah. ivy grows crazy and it's not good for you. Maybe yeah, but, I heard it wrong. You know, but poison ivy grows in much more abundance now than it did before before of all the pollution part of the the air pollution has resulted in in uh much more poison ivy and what does poison ivy attack where do we skin. feel it the no, skin okay. so again it's that metal energy out of balance and the and the world uh and the and the plant world letting us know that uh you um there are many plants that are not going to be good for you. So you need to, um, if you're going to be eating plants, you like to buy seeds and grow plants from a plant store so that you know that they are um, the ones that are going to be good for you. Uh, back in the day, we used to be able to tell by our sense of smell and our sense of taste which plants were good for us and which, which ones weren't. But we have we have long ago given up our own sense of smell and taste uh, to listen to other people's voices and, uh, and rules and rules and stuff. So I think that, um, uh, you know, if you're gathering plants in the wild, you, you need to A, know what you're gathering and B, uh, remember that you don't want to pick all of them. You know, you're not harvesting a field when you forage wild. You're, 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 you know, you're part of um, a bigger ecosystem. It's not your neighborhood, actually, it's theirs. And you need to say thanks and, and treat them with respect and not take all of the plant so that it has a chance to grow and continue. So that's, um, yeah. But the natural world of plants, all the plants provide us with oxygen. And that's the most important thing that they give us for our health, is the air that we breathe. I have a question. Okay, Gamer. Uh, yeah, on the ginger, because I usually do the candy ginger, which of course adds a little sugar to it. Um, can you dehydrate it? Will it survive that? Candy? Or does it come out like balsa wood? What, say that again? Can you dehydrate it, or does it come out rather like balsa wood? Oh, the ginger or candy? Yeah. Ginger. I don't know about candied ginger. No, but fresh ginger. Can I dehydrate it? Yeah, you can. And you Does can it make come out okay. Uh, the fresher, the better. Um, yeah. But um, I mean, I'm looking at this little piece here. This is kind of soft and wobbly, and I don't know if I would, you know, I. This is kind of dried out. But if you dry it out, that's fine. You can dehydrate. You have a high dehydrator. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, that would be perfect. I would like, I might, um, yeah, I, as, if you're gonna put it in boiling water, then you don't need to worry so much about the skin. I might like pour some boiling water over it and then, um, and then slice it in and dehydrate it that way. Okay, because okay. I mean, I normally do the, the candy, but that adds sugar. So I was thinking for tea, maybe see if it'll dehydrate and not turn into balsa wood. Well, it will turn into balsa wood, but if you boil it, it'll, it'll be okay. Yeah, uh, some, things, some things lose their flavor in dehydrating. I think ginger loses that much flavor dehydrated. Yeah. I think it okay. condenses it, actually. But candy ginger is okay, too. What are you candying? Uh, brown sugar or honey? Yeah. Um, sometimes honey, sometimes brown sugar. Yeah, you had that when you were here a couple of years, a few years back. I love candy ginger. Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah, you already, then you would make the tea with your candy ginger. Right, right. But I'm just saying for further storage, maybe if drying would be better than candying it. Sure tastes good candied, I have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, um, but drawing it will work. I think Noelle's got a question also. Wait, uh, Noelle, you got to unmute yourself. Can you do that? Yes, um, I was just going to say that, you know, I'm using fresh ginger right now in my bell peppers, okay? But, Ooh. and so, but the deal is, if I use powdered ginger, like it's dried, and I guess they dry it first, and then they mortar, they, I don't know, they, they pulverize that baby. And yeah. it just is, it's just not the same. No, I'm it's not. It's, when it's dried, I think that there is a, a, a loss of flavor. That's, but I just wanted to say that. I think that um, one of the things that Dr. Lou said, he, he said put in two tea bags. And I think that that is part of the compensating for that loss of flavor. And I think the other piece of that is you definitely have to boil it. And that's the thing when you add dried ginger to something, how long are you going to cook it after you've yeah. put it in? Okay. And so I don't know what you're doing with your, your peppers. Are you cooking them with the ginger in them? Yes, in fact, I'm stuffing them. Um, I'm doing this Moroccan thing, so that's why I, I'm putting in fresh ginger with the um, greens and the uh, carrots and oh, dried apricots because I looked for raisins, but the dried apricots are less expensive. So I'm like, okay, I'll go. Yeah. That sounds like a good combo. Um, the thing about the ginger is, and I haven't tried this, so I can't vouch for it, but I, um, if you've got a fresh ginger like that and you've got these little nodes on it, if you put it in a, in a box, you could grow it year round in Tucson, but in the Northeast here where I am, um, I am told that if I plant the, this in the ground, that um, come fall, I will, be able to harvest quite a bit of ginger out. Okay. Have you tried that, Tamer? You're nodding your head. Have you grown ginger? Tell us about it. It's a nice plant, but I was just thinking on, as in part of our dinner tonight, I'd had some horseradish leaves in the front, and you mm -hmm. can add those in food too. So I put that in with the Swiss chard in with our stir fry. But, wow. and you can use the, the leaves on, on, on ginger in a similar sort of way. Really? Yeah. I have never done yeah. that. Good. Yeah, because I, because the garlic isn't ready yet, so I use garlic leaves and the horseradish leaves and Ooh. they're good in that. Same right. sort of You're thing. coming over to your house for dinner. Uh, okay. <laughs> then we're going to go over to Noelle's house. <laughs> oh, well, absolutely. Let's make a, a, a daisy cake. Now, huh? well, I didn't hear what you last said, Tamer. Oh, I was just saying, let's do kind of a, like a daisy chain. Oh. That, we could. that would be good. We, we'd have to get the jet, Learjet out of the shop, though. <sighs> yeah. Because we've got Michelle in California, you're in West Virginia, Noelle's in Arizona, I'm in Maine, and Roberta's in New York. So hmm. she's in New York with a Maine shirt on. I'm in West Virginia with an Arizona shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just to confuse people. Yes. Where would we rather be at this moment, huh? 110 <laughs> degrees. Oh, uh, well, you were on at the beginning of the phone call when Noelle was telling us about the fires there. There's been a lot oh, of I know. I've heard that the Catalinas are on fire again. Oh, that's terrible. So do we have any more questions or comments? Not on that, no. Or anything else? So, well, it's been lovely to spend a um, wonderful evening with everyone. And uh, please uh, check out the blog post on my, on my web, uh, website. And the um, YouTube video will go up a little bit later. And you can just click on it and like it and share it if you wouldn't mind. I would appreciate that. All right. Well, thank, thank you, Susan. You so much, everybody. Bye. Bye. I'm going to go make my ginger tea right now. Have fun. I think I'm going to make a cocktail. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> How about a beer?
Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, trying to put together.